Okay, make sure, oops, make sure this thing is on and it's focused. Hi. Uh, I mentioned last, in the last class, Europe's attempts to unify. Um, all right. The first one was the common market. The idea was to get rid of tariffs so that every nation could trade from one country to another without paying a tariff. Uh, the common market eventually gave way to the European Union or EU. Now there was something else involved besides a tariff, and that's something that I ran into at Lockheed, a worldwide standard of quality. Um, at one time it was ISO 1000, and I'd go to shopping at, at uh, Lowe's or at uh, Home Depot, and they'd say this air conditioner was made according to ISO 1000 standards. ISO 1000 meant that every part in that air conditioner was put together under controlled standards to guarantee that the quality would be, well, it would be top notch up to a standard. Now, I worked in a lab one time at Lockheed. In fact, my last days at Lockheed were spent in a lab. And I was, my job was to go around and collect the temperature charts to make sure that the temperature in the lab was up to par. And one day, some of the workers in another lab said, hey, is there anything you do to heat the place up in here? We're cold, we're shivering cold. Now, if someone had asked you that, I mean, this is a lab, you know, a lab at Lockheed, big corporation, if someone asked you, what can we do to get the, the temperature in this lab warmer? What would you say to them? Anybody have any idea? I know what I said. I said, These, the temperature in this lab is set to a worldwide standard. That's a little bit cold for the southeastern part of the United States. But we must maintain that temperature in order to be certified. If you're cold, put on your lab jacket. Put on a sweater, and I don't wear sweaters at Lockheed even in July. Put on a sweater, put on a lab jacket, but there's nothing we can do to change the temperature because this temperature is set according to a worldwide standard. You know, the temperature was controlled, and all of this to guarantee that every part manufactured um, was conformed to a certain standard. Every piece of metal had uniform strength throughout the entire piece of metal. And this was put blacksmiths out of bed, because you cannot blacksmith a piece of iron and have it have uniform strength throughout the iron. I mean, you just can't get that with a hammer and an anvil. But, um, but we have ways to do that, to guarantee that every piece of metal put in every part, every wire is set to a standard, a worldwide standard that helps to guarantee quality and everything, and eliminate lemons. And folk, maybe you don't appreciate it, because you don't know the difference. Today's automobiles are much, much, much better than the automobiles put out 50 years ago. I mean, the old car, 50 years ago, well, this month it's the battery. Next month it might be the muffler. Then after the month, that would be a ball bearing. Then it would be a failure with the transmission. Then it would be a couple of tires. Then the next month would be a couple more tires. And um, today you can drive cars for months on end without needing any more maintenance than maybe an oil change and, a, and gasoline. Now the only difference, though, in my opinion, though, too, okay. is, well, not 50 years ago, but maybe, maybe 30, 40 yeah. was the way the cars are made, the material that was used, yeah. they seem to be more sturdier. Heavier, uh, perhaps. Heavier, because now the way our cars are made, I can give it one hard, shown enough kick. And it'll you know, well, it'll that, that, there's some truth in that. But also today, you start today's car engine, it'll sound like tinny, tin panning and weak compared to, but, yeah. Uh, not only, well, the cars, but a lot of other goods. When, it, when I like looked at some of them, it kind of seems like more a lot of the newer stuff is prone to break down and stuff like that. A lot easier than stuff made in the old days. I personally think that's just because they want you to buy a lot more. Listen, stuff. that was what we said years and years and years ago. That the old was the new had more features and more gadgets and more attachments, but the old was sturdier, stronger. Yeah. That's true. I that's mean, in so my there's opinion, a lot of, there's some truth in it. Okay, there's some truth in that. Um, you gotta admit, sometimes they just want you to buy another product. So. Well, I've heard of this yeah. about cars. The softer metal, and it is softer, yeah. makes it easier for you to survive in a crash. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the one benefit from having softer metal. 
the hard metal was a little bit different. Oh, by the way, I'm, in, I'm trying to save the school money or not, so I don't turn all the lights on. Oh, uh, the, the, the yeah, work. Work, huh? Do you like it the other way? How many of you like it the other way? I can. I mean, I'm okay. How many of you like I'm okay with either way. I'm okay, okay. with either way. The majority, the majority rules. Turn it on. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna grouchy boot today. I don't wanna fuss at nobody. Oops. Oops. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I'm very sorry you feel grouchy, my friend. Oh uh, well, you you have the that. The ones over there on the edges have the light, and the ones over in the middle. Okay. All right, anyway, leave, leaving that. Um, common market, trying to unify, get all world products to a unified standard. The common market gave way to the European Union or the EU, and um, the problem with the EU is, again, it's these foreigners that some of the countries are taking in and demanding that other countries take them in also. And two countries, namely Slovakia and Poland, have said we're not taking in any more of these uh, foreigners and they've gotten a lot of condemnation from the other members of the European Union. This business of taking in foreigners is also a hot issue in the United States. Uh, they developed a common union currency called the Euro and most European nations are now using the Euro. Now Great Britain refused to have its British town part, become part of the Euro so Great Britain still goes by the British pound. The most of the rest of the nations on the European continent use the Euro. All right, moving on from Europe now to the United States, and I'm going to be spending a good bit of time talking about the United States. As a result of the war, industrial output increased, and unlike in Germany and Japan, the United States factories were not bombed during the war. So. And also, we did something that Germany and Japan did not do. We scattered our factories throughout our large country. And like when I worked at Lockheed, part of an airplane would be assembled at Fort Worth. Another part might be assembled at Florida somewhere. We have a factory in Florida. Another part assembled here in Marietta. Um, in other words, we scattered our factories out. And also, when Lockheed was built at the start of World War II, there are no windows in the main building, not one. This would make it more difficult for enemy planes to find our factory. The German factories and the Japanese had windows all up and down. You could tell because they had rows and rows of windows. Easy to find, easy to spot at night, easy to bomb. And uh, they bunched their industries together. We didn't, but our factories were not hit. Now, just before, well, before we got involved in World War II, the United States was helping Britain and the Soviet Union fight the Germany, so our depression ended. Our depression ended because we were sending armaments. I mean, I had a pupil ask me just last spring, what does war have to do with the economy? During wartime, everybody is in full. Because every factory knows the government is going to buy everything they produce, so produce as much as you can and sell it to the government. But uh, there is some private sales going on to individuals, but mostly producers. And the factories would start stealing each other's workers, and then they'd start increasing wages. Well, to keep down wages, because the government had to buy this stuff, uh, the government set li wage limits. Well, that's when factories started giving benefits, medical benefits and health benefits. And uh, it started about the time before World War II. And this trend for factories to give health care is still going on. And in fact, Obamacare required it full-time employees receive health care if you worked for an organization that was had so many employees you had to the, the factory owner had to give health care the bad part about this is it made it harder for people to find full-time work places hired particularly restaurants hired part-time help so they wouldn't have to pay benefits now to encourage home buying the government gave interest. The, ta the, the government gave tax deductions on home loans. That law was still in a book. Now, up until Ronald Reagan's time, any interest you took on any loan, even credit cards, was tax deductible. Ronald Reagan got a law passed that only the interest on home loans was tax deductible. Um, I want to say this about home loan. I, I tried to encourage my, one of my daughters to buy a house instead of pay rent. 
and she said the problem with buying a house is you're stuck with it. Now, that doesn't mean you can't sell it. With a, well, okay, with a house you can sell it any time, but also if you take out a mortgage, that mortgage is tax deductible. If you pay rent, the rent is not tax deductible. Mm -hmm. Some of you might be aware of this already. But interest on home loans is now, there are moves in Congress to get the interest on home loans taken away. At the moment though, it's still there. And uh, when you take out a loan on a, a, a home that's worth $100,000 or more, the interest on it can be quite large. Again, I could spend a whole period talking about interest, but I won't. The GI Bill of Rights passed shortly after World War II. The GI Bill gave tuition, paid tuition and books, and in some cases room and board, to veterans who had served in the military during the war. That law is still in the books, and a lot of my pupils have gone to school on a GI Bill. One of my brothers went through three years of college on a GI Bill, and he never did finish, but uh, he uh, went on the GI Bill. Um, still on the books. And one thing that the GI Bill did, it, when the war was over and everybody was returning home from the war, they went to their jobs. So the government passed a law that all the places that you had worked before had to hire you back. Now, after World War I, this was not so. My grandfather worked at a factory before World War I. He went and joined the army to fight in World War I, came home and found they wouldn't hire him back. But that, well, that's been outlawed since. If you serve in the army, the place you worked before is obligated to hire you back. And if you're on a seniority system, give you all your seniority. Uh, but, uh, but one thing, though, that helped is instead of these people getting in the workforce at once, a lot of them went to college. And this kept them out of the workforce for the three or four years, that whatever length of time they were in college. Some cases more like five. But anyway, this kept them out of the workforce while the civilian world got ready for them. Um, the federal government became more and more powerful than before as the federal government got involved in things they hadn't gotten involved in before, including welfare. The United States was heading toward a welfare state, even as Europe was, but the United States' welfare state was more restrictive. Um, now, I, and a lot, okay, I mean, I've been called opinionated. Personally, I think the welfare state's a really bad idea, and, but some of you might not think so. Uh, but uh, for instance, Canada. Canada adopted the European type welfare state, and a lot of patients in Canada have died waiting to see their doctor. I mean, you know, you, uh, you're diagnosed with something like possible colorectal cancer today, you might get an appointment in February or maybe even later than that. And a lot of persons died waiting to see the doctor. Mm -hmm. This is true in Europe also. Um, but so we, we restricted our welfare state more than the other, in, the other industrialized nations. And uh, now we have a bunch of people running for president who say that the other countries can do it, why can't we? Mm -hmm. Time will tell. The Democratic Party would pass more socialistic legislation which the Republican Party would not get rid of. In other words, the Democratic Party passed Social Security, the Republican Party never got rid of it. Similar to Britain, the one party would pass it, when the other party got in power, they would keep it. Um, Medicare. Now, Social Security had been passed by Roosevelt's New Deal. I'll have more to say about Medicare in a few minutes. That came up under John Kennedy. The 50s and 60s were both prosperous times for America, for most people. Now, take that tongue-in-cheek. Uh, we have a history book that this school used that said in the 1950s, one-third of Americans lived in poverty, including me, by the way. I mean, I don't hesitate to tell you. Um, but for the most part, the, the, 
America was prosperous during the 50s and 60s. Now, in the early 70s, we experienced a recession, and things got a little bit tighter, and inflation really took over for a time. But in the 50s and 60s, things were prosperous for America. A I large. Ask you, yes. How would you define poverty? Okay, that, I'm really glad you asked that. It's where you live below the level of the people in your society. Now, for instance, today we have people drawing welfare check, welfare, well, I'll call them welfare moms or welfare parents, who have a big screen color TV and who have cell phones and our kids have iPads, but they're not making enough money to feed themselves, so they're depending on government welfare. Uh, again, it, it, it's all based on the standard of living of the people around you. Now, okay, I say we, I grew up in poverty. For the most part, we had a telephone. We did not have a television. I mean, but uh, that put us away from everybody else did, but we didn't. And we drove an old rattle trap car that gave us continual trouble. One, my dad went through one used car after another until he finally bought a new one. Uh, that was what we call poverty. Where you're behind the average. And now there are guidelines, federal guidelines. For instance, in 1965, the average wage was for a male worker was 5000 a year. That was average. That year, my dad made 2000 So, gotcha. Yeah, that's poverty. Right. And uh, we, we had to have the school pay for our lunches. Um, you know, and hey, I'll tell you, put it this way: we were ashamed of it to show a ticket instead of pay the money, show a ticket. We were ashamed of it. But today's kids, at least when I taught them, they were proud. Hey, we get a free lunch. Today's kid, maybe I don't know about today's kids, but the kids when I taught in the early seventies, they were they were proud of it. Um, but it's basically where you live behind. Now, to talk about people in England living in the slums what's called the slums, they have an automobile and big screen TV and their kids have cell phones and iPods and things like that. Um, again, when you're behind everybody else. The interstate, highway, all right. Here was, the idea of an interstate was actually Adolf Hitler's. It was part of Hitler's preparation for war. So when Eisenhower went to Germany to fight the Germans, he saw the turn, the Autobahns, the Autobahns. Now, if you know anything about German autobahns, we don't do that here. A German autobahn will go for miles and miles, straight, 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 super straight, and then they'll warn you about starting about two miles when there's a curve, and everybody goes as fast as his car can go. There is no speed limit on the autobahns. You go, and then when you come to a curve, you have to slow your car down, make the curve, and then go straight again for maybe a few miles. Um, we believe that if you have too much straight road, you'll get what's called driving hypnosis, where you won't see anything but the road, and we even see the signs on the side, and you see the curb, and you'll crash into somebody that you don't even see. It's called driving hypnosis. We believe there should be gentle curves to keep a body awake enough to. I mean, anyway, the interstate system, we copied the European system. An interstate highway, a superhighway that has no crossroads, all roads that must cross to either go above it or below it. You, it's limited access, you can only get on it through ramps. You're limited in, on and off. And it's a really fast way to travel. You can hardly beat it. Yes, I, I got on line 285 to get here this morning. I mean, uh, even though I will say this about 285, I averaged about 15 miles an hour because of the heavy traffic. But anyway, but normally, I mean, if you get the picture, it's faster. Right. And uh, also, at that time of morning, even the non-interstates would have been slow. So it's still the best way to travel if you're traveling by car. Now, I know a lady who will not get on a turnpike because the, the speed is too fast and they're dangerous, uh, be that as it may. To me, they're the safest way to travel also. But when you have an accident, it can get bad. Yes, because the speed is fast. That's true. I've come close to having them more than I feel like talking about. Some of them were not my fault. This car got out of control and it hit a wall. And I'm not sure. There's nothing I can do to stop him. I slowed down. When we hit the wall, he was out of my path and I was able to get around him. Otherwise, there would have been nothing I could have done to avoid hitting him. This happened about a year and a half ago. 
But anyway, federal taxes paid for and state taxes. So now basically, each state was expected to contribute its fair share to get the interstate going. More and more workers, I mean, more and more Americans left their farms and got to work in factories. I have an aunt and uncle who tried farming for a few years and found they could not make a living on it. So my uncle went and got a job at a factory in 1959. Yeah. Got a job as a pipe fitter, making catches close. Three dollars and forty cents an hour. And my, they, my mom and dad thought, hey, that is real money. He, that, that was, he was able to buy a new car and a nice new home for that, with that money and retire comfortably. Another three forty an hour went up and up and up. That was when a minimum wage was a dollar an hour, which it was for a good many years. Um, but that was when bread was what? Ten cent a loaf? Uh, gasoline was thirty two cents gasoline a gallon. 30, for many, right. Many years. So right. Yeah. yeah. For many years gasoline was thirty two cents a gallon. Um, but uh, lot, again a lot of Americans took jobs in factories. Now People began congregating in cities, moving from country to city. The cities had to develop better sewer systems, and also the cities had to clean up their air. <laughs> Pittsburgh, for instance, said it was a dirty city at one time, but then they started passing their anti-soap laws. And today, the air, the, the air in Pittsburgh is much, much cleaner. And Pittsburgh is one example of how a dirty city cleaned itself up. Now, in the early 1950s, we experienced a Red Scare led by a man named Joseph McCarthy. It actually was our second Red Scare. The first Red Scare had occurred after World War I, when the Soviet Union was formed in Russia, and then when the communists took over Russia, there were rumors that the communists were putting themselves in key positions to take over America, and particularly hard hit was the movie industry, of which Ronald Reagan was a part, and Ronald Reagan made it a point to fight communism. But a lot of movies were said to be made promoting communism, and perhaps some of them were. But McCarthy went around the country accusing a lot of folk of being communists, and nobody dared stand up to him and oppose him. But finally he went too far and accused the army of being infiltrated by communists, and at that point he got Eisenhower against him. And when and Eisenhower was one of the most popular men in America at the time, he was soon to be elected president. But when, I, when McCarthy got Eisenhower against him, his world fell apart. McCarthy gave himself over, over to drinking. The Senate censored him, and his movement just fell apart. Now, I had a student do a paper on this one time. We took the opposite view that the Red Scare really was a genuine fear. Today it's looked on as being a paranoia. But there really were communists infiltrating and attempting to take over, and a lot of Americans were actually communist sympathizers, particularly college teachers. Yeah, when I was at UT, I had a college teacher, Paul Pinckney by name, who was an open Marxist, convinced Marxist. Um, but anyway, uh, then they, they were, the college teachers were accused of infiltrating, but a lot of college teachers, high school teachers, got fired, lost their jobs over that issue, and a lot of careers were ruined, a lot of lives were permanently ruined, as McCarthy called them communist. Now to take the place, there is a society around, it's, you don't hear much about it anymore, called the John Birch Society. The John Birch Society uh, still is fighting communist. The number one fighter of communist, other than McCarthy, was a man named Richard Milhouse Nixon, who got elected to the Senate and got elected first to the House of Representatives into the Senate by calling the, his opponents communist. He ran against a woman one time named Voorhees. He won the election by calling her a communist. Years later, he said, I knew all along she wasn't a communist, but I had the election to win. Eventually, now, we're going to talk about it. You all may, may all know Nixon's antics caught up with him. But um, anyway, another thing, too, Richard Nixon was the only one in Eisenhower's administration who called Fidel Castro a communist. And guess what? He proved to be right. 
Castro took over Cuba and immediately made overtures to the Soviet Union. All right. Eisenhower's administration was looked on as being benign. I remember reading a book, a textbook in college that in the 1950s our country had an amiable old man as president who had limited intellectual resources, partly because Eisenhower did not promote social legislation, did not promote the New Deal. He got elected by promising to clean up the mess in Washington, but when he got in office, he, he didn't do anything new, he just didn't get away rid of the old anyway, either. All right. In his place, the country elected John Kennedy. Now, a big issue, folks, and I'm not going to sweep it under the rug, I mean, but a big issue is when Kennedy was running was his Roman Catholicism. We had had a president in 1928 who was Roman Catholic run for president, Al Smith by name. Al Smith got nowhere. But Kennedy was an open, I mean, open Roman Catholic, and uh, he knew the Protestants were fighting him, and a lot of Protestants banded together to try to make sure he did not become president. Kennedy ran against Richard Nixon. Nixon had been, um, Eisenhower's vice president. Now, it is now pretty well established, folk, this is no longer a that Nixon actually won the election in 1960. Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., John Kennedy's father, was had connections with the Mafia, the gang, and Joseph P. Kennedy managed to rig some votes in the Chicago area a few thousand votes that turned the whole election to his son, John Kennedy. Now, Nixon was asked, do you want to have a recount? And Nixon refused to recount, partly because the Kennedy camp got word that the Nixon camp had fudged on some election results also. So both sides was possibly one as guilty as the other. So Kennedy did not prosecute Nixon. Nixon did not contest Kennedy. Kennedy became president. Um, even though, by rights, possibly Nixon won the election, but again, uh, then after you know more than six, so 59 years, this is pretty well proven. Okay, Kennedy promised we're going to get tough on communists. That last administration, Eisenhower, he was weak on communism. We're going to get tough. We're going to stop the Soviet Union. And his first move was to order the invasion of Cuba. He sent some Cubans, he, uh, he sent Cubans into Cuba to take back Cuba from Fidel Castro. And he promised that the United States Air Force would move in and give them air support. You know, bomb, basically bomb Castro's men. This help was not given. He got cold feet. And again, I'm not surprised why. And folks, we had just last month, we had the same thing, similar happen. We had a president about ready to strike a country that struck us. And at the last minute, our present president decided not to. And I'm, I mean, I, if I'd have been in his shoes, I might have done the same thing. Because <coughs> the strike might lead to a bigger conflict. Somehow or another, John Kennedy was, decided not to support the people invading Cuba, and to this day, the Cubans living in Miami and southern Florida hate John Kennedy. To this day, they have not forgiven him. Oh yeah, the, one, the ones, I mean, have, the one, most of the ones who were alive then have died of old age, but they pass their hatred on to the next generation, the next generation after that. And to this day, even the grandchildren of the persons who were betrayed by John Kennedy. This was a black mark in Kennedy's administration. He had another black mark at the time. He could not get his legislation passed. He had all these big plans for the country. He got up Medicare, medical care for the aged. He got up federal aid to education. He got up the Civil Rights Act to help blacks be able to vote, particularly in the South. Um, all this legislation he got up, he could not get passed. This Congress, then part of it was due to his own fault. Well, 
For instance, the best legislative arm twister in the world was a man by the name Lyndon Johnson, Kennedy's vice president. If Kennedy would have used Johnson, Johnson could probably, Johnson knew his way around the Senate better than Kennedy did. Johnson knew his way around Congress better than Kennedy did. Instead, Johnson put Kennedy out. Uh, Kennedy needed Johnson to win the election. During the primaries, Johnson had been Kennedy's chief rival, and Kennedy knew that Johnson could get all these votes, so he put Johnson on the ticket, and uh, with Johnson on the ticket, Kennedy got the election, and it's doubtful that Kennedy would have won without Johnson. 